Dear guests, students, and colleagues, welcome to the 2015 Lemke Lecture at NHH. First, some practical information. Emergency exits are to my left towards the road. The doors will open automatically in case of need. On the balcony, the exits are to my right. There is no need to walk downstairs. After the lecture, there may be time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, this week, it's 160 years since the birth of Christopher Lemkel, or Stasrud Lemkel, as he is usually called. Lemkel's struggles over many years is the main reason we are all here today. He was a successful businessman in the fishing and shipping industries. For a brief but extremely important period of this nation's history, he was a member of the government. Every September since 1958, NHH has organized a lecture in honor of Christopher Lemkel, featuring a prominent leader from Norwegian business or government. Last year, we invited an international business leader. This year's speaker is a Norwegian businessman with enormous international success. Jon Fredrik Boxos last month retired as CEO of Telenor. Boxos and his predecessor, Tomer Hermansen, the 1995 Lemkel lecturer, had transformed Telenor from a rather staid Norwegian public telephone company to a modern global, global mobile operator. Based in a country of 5 million people, Telenor today has close to 200 million customers. 20 years ago, nobody would have considered this development even remotely possible. The success of Telenor should be an inspiration to all of us. We too may succeed in the new economy. Jon Fredrik Boxos is also currently the chairman of the Global GSM Association, and he is, of course, a graduate of NHH. The title of this year's Lemkel Lecture is Here, There and Everywhere, Empowering the Many, Not Just the Few. I'm extremely happy to welcome Jon Fredrik Boxos back to NHH. Yeah, thank you for the um, introduction. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, and um, even some friends I can see in this hall, so that's good to note. So thank you for that. Thank you for coming, I'd say. Let's um, have some vote afterwards, see whether it, whether it was worth it. Um, but to your introduction, um, 160 years, that's also Telenor's anniversary this year. So it's the same year, actually, when he was born in 1855. So that's a little bit of a comparison. Um, I thought this, I should start this um, lecture with um, an old anecdote, but there are other things uh, going around, going on in Europe uh, at our doorstep for the time being, which I want to give a little bit of reflection of. Uh, even also after seeing Kvelsnytt um, uh, at um, television uh, yesterday night, uh, the refugee issue for Europe is a big issue. It's a very, very big issue on the doorstep. And uh, it potentially also threatened to um, uh, challenge uh, some of the um, written, uh, written truths about, of the, about Europe. We also could hear that the EU yesterday decided on how to distribute 120,000 uh, refugees. This is a major uh, immigrant question, which, is, uh, which needs to be, be taken seriously on uh, every doorstep. Um, we had this situation for Norway as well. Uh, how many people left for US? Uh, question mark. A big portion of the Norwegian population. Uh, how many people left to, through Sweden uh, during the war? I heard a figure of 50,000. Um, in a previous presentation, I don't know whether that's historically correct, but I heard that number. And um, okay, so, of course, we have had it, but we're not used to it in uh, the volumes that we have seen these days. But why is it so? The digital part of our economies in these days are so strong that they manage to follow people 
step by step through their journeys. And of course also the distribution of uh, this new trade, so to speak, where people are being shipped from country to country uh, with a fairly um, undescribed target at the end of it uh, comes so close to us. So we get it personally and we can follow this. Why is that so? That's because of the mobile phone. Um, Syrians coming from uh, through Turkey uh, enter into uh, Greece. The first thing they do is to take a selfie and send it back home. So the digital world is in a way also bringing forward this issue to, to us as we speak. Uh, news have been there before, but they have been communicated through letters and through people telling it to each other. Whereas today, news come to everyone in one go, so to speak. So it is a new world out there. And uh, one could say that populations are being empowered by mobile phone, by mobile connectivity, with the ability to communicate and to take in information instantly. As we said here, everywhere and always. Um, we are in the midst of this. We are in the midst of a business model uh, of uh, these things to happen. We feel it's a, both a um, sustainable and responsible business to bring about, to flourish, and to bring people into connectivity. Because we believe that is a platform also for the less fortunate to uh, bring a, in a better future for themselves. And by the way, under these circumstances, we also believe it's the right thing to do. Like us going to Myanmar, which will be uh, criticized, um, already is, it's a part of bringing transparency, later on also democracy, into these countries. It's a kind of unlocker to uh, things that previously were locked in. So let's that be uh, my sort of entry point here, the power of empowerment. One of the very best um, examples of empowerment that I have come by through these years is the following. This is um, a village lady in Gramin Phone in Bangladesh. Uh, this, was, uh, this happened in the middle of um, our rollout um, uh, for, for 2G, back in, uh, I believe, maybe 99, 2000, 2001. Uh, and we were literally rolling out the network, village by village. And in these villages, uh, which have had no connectivity from before, often lack of electricity as well. Um, the first typical user was the information hub, the already female in that uh, village that had taken the control of the information flow. We know that kind of person from our own local communities. <laughs> so they are there as well. Um, pretty forthcoming, uh, curious on the next uh, news item, etc., etc. So she stepped forward to me when we had made this um, uh, connectivity to this village. And she uh, uh, came and said, um, please, Mr. Boxos, please make sure that I am the only one that gets the mobile phone in my village. <laughs> OK? So she knew the value of information. She knew what she was getting, what kind of power she got in the local community from the mobile phone. And she had taken a microloan from Grameen Bank to buy the phone and to buy the SIM card. And she put it together and she became the phone booth of, uh, of the village, selling airtime, probably also monopoly priced uh, in the beginning. <laughs> of course, I could not promise her that she would be alone with the mobile phone for years. Uh, it's been our mantra all the time, this is not for the few. This is for the many. The mobile phone is to become everyone's tool of communication. That was our mantra when we started in, uh, in, Asia, in Asia in particular. Um, now we are uh, serving 53 million people in Grameen Phone with modern connectivity, 2G, 3G, soon also 4G. 53 million in Grameen Phone alone. The country has roughly 
90% penetration by population, but that doesn't mean that we reach out to 90% of the population, because uh, several it's pretty us uh, useful to have um, usual to have uh, two SIM cards at least by one person. And Bangladesh is probably one of the very best examples on how a uh, technology platform was rolled out and really started to empower the, uh, the, the society, the, the society at large, to a new level, because there are no fixed line uh, outside the cities of uh, Bangladesh. So the rollout was very important to create uh, connectivity uh, around in the, in, the, in the country. In addition to that, the, comp the company Grameen Phone has become the number one taxpayer in the country. Two to three percent of all tax income in the country comes from one source, Grameen Phone. Uh, and we pay roughly close to 50% of all uh, TACA paid uh, build to, um, to uh, the government. So the taxation level is substantial. And then it comes as, an, uh, as a big contribu contributor to the capital markets as well, since we stocklisted it uh, with a 10% um, uh, part some years ago. So we're building new capacities into the country by this rollout and this development. Uh, we see then that uh, the change agent in the Bangladeshi society really comes from this rollout of uh, you know, new technology, and people embrace it. I also have to uh, then thank you for inviting me back here. There is um, quite some years since I've been here before. I think I've only been here uh, three, maybe four times after I left uh, with my diploma under, in my hand out of this very hall uh, in um, May 1979. So it's, uh, it's quite um, good to be back. Little I knew what my career would be, as probably most of you when you left this hall. Uh, and for you that are going to leave this hall with some uh, of, the, uh, of the same feeling, I just have to say there are plenty of possibilities out there. Make yourself visible and you will be uh, noticed. And here we go. And the careers are probably interesting and will go many ways for those that are still here as a student. Kristin Skogen Lund, uh, who worked with us in Telenor for some years, she was also here in 2012. And she made the remark that um, it was an interesting list of previous lectures that uh, sort of gave a um, description from year to year on how um, the Norwegian society has developed itself and also how it uh, goes international. And we are probably a kind of example of that as well. She also talked about um, embracing change. Change in our technology field is very, very important. If we don't embrace change in our field of work, others will step in and overtake you pretty rapidly. Uh, which means that um, uh, if you don't apply the new technology, the latest technology, uh, if you believe that uh, the challenges on old technology will disappear and uh, the old one will win over new ones, forget it. In our space, if you don't apply the latest technology uh, in how you develop your uh, operating model, you are soon out of date. And uh, you mentioned um, uh, Torben Hermansen in 1995. His main topic was how do we take the monopoly organization, Televerke, into becoming a comp competitive organization. And many of you uh, have probably experienced a little bit about uh, the struggle uh, as customers uh, when, uh, we had when we moved from the one to the other. But we can see that um, uh, right of 2015, we're still a living animal. We, have, we are still pretty good uh, positioned in Norway, and we're doing, uh, we, have, we are probably in Norway one of the best networks in, in Europe when it comes to how it's distributed, what capacities are there. That doesn't mean that you have all what you need uh, everywhere where you are. 
because uh, I can uh, vividly understand that there are some people here that don't feel they have sufficient connectivity at their cabin, at their road from your home to your cabin, et cetera, et cetera. But take a look of Norway, and take a look of Denmark, and then you have a little bit of the explanation. Um, now, having left the um, CEO position of Telenor a little bit more than a month ago, um, I can break out um, from what I've been promising myself, never look back. Now I can allow myself to look back a little bit to, the, to your question. Uh, how did this come about? So let's start a little bit on um, uh, the following thinking. I think we can say that a little bit of Telenor's position also comes from other industries in Norway. And again, sea-based uh, activity has been, put, has been putting pressure on Telenor in many ways. The telegraph, really, was what brought the cod from um, uh, Lofoten to Italy. They understood that the telegraph was uh, the immediate way of communicating on their new har uh, harvest to the new markets. So telecommunication has pushed for new sol uh, solutions also in other industries. And you can extend this into more modern times when we uh, started to really explore uh, the, uh, the North Sea. Satellite communication became a driver for this, both for navigation and for precise uh, location uh, in, uh, in the North Sea. So there has been industry drivers for a better telecom quality uh, all around. So customer has put pressure on us. New solutions uh, could come. And in a way, Norway, Sweden, Finland pioneered the GSM through the NMT system. The NMT systems were basically the, uh, the, 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 the core that f the learning from NMT was turned into principles, and these were then embedded in the new GSM digital uh, first uh, digital system that came around in um, 1992 in Norway, and licenses were distributed in 1991. So we are, uh, you could say, well, it's pure luck, it's pure smartness. Is it, it is smartness, or what, what's the portion of smartness and what's the smart, uh, what's portion of, of luck here? But let me repeat then what I said uh, when I started. At the bottom of this, we believe that the mobile phone could, would become everyone's tool. And with that mindset, you in a way got, another, got to another point than if you had started the rollout to say, the mobile phone is only for the rich. And that created the difference. So we are a product of a good blend of um, um, a long-term owner, I'd say. We had a long-term uh, owner in the Norwegian state who gave us also a risk portion to go with when we started the international journey mid-90s. Uh, and then the people in Telenor gradually also started to develop a business culture which were capable of handling this growth as we moved around. Because it is not uh, that easy to go from a pure national uh, operation to a multinational uh, operation and still maintain a business culture that drives the whole system at the same time. And we were not a centralized model. We had a decentralized model where CEOs per country was the prime driver. But in this play, uh, I believe there is um, uh, three at least uh, defining moments uh, on where, what took Telenor um, uh, into this journey. It was first and foremost to go international. Uh, and that came uh, uh, 1992, 1993, and uh, then came incorporation in 1994, after the Olympics. The Olympics had 25,000 handsets in play. It was the, the most concentrated mobile experience that had ever been uh, seen. And Hillary Clinton, which was there, she spoke with Bill Clinton uh, in the car, 
uh, on the, a Telenor mobile, and she and uh, Bill Clinton wasn't that interested in um, in, uh, in in the Olympics. But he said, "How how can you call me from the middle of nowhere?" And then she said, well, I'm calling you on a mobile phone. And he was sitting in a car someplace in, in the US. And it was the liberalization. Um, it was uh, to move from monopoly to competition. And there we understood that the Norwegian market, we had to share that one with others. Which means then we can go into other markets and take a share there, take a portion there, which we did. And this was broadly uh, anchored uh, as sort of one defining uh, element in Telenor's development in cooperation and go international. To the extent that also the Norwegian state added two uh, billion Norwegian kroner as equities on top of the equity that came around during incorporation in 1996 and 1998, before stock listing in, uh, stock listing in 2000. And this was broadly anchored. The second uh, defining moment was when we made this one. Doesn't say that much. You can see it's an old slide. It was even, uh, even in plastic, I believe. Um, SK100. SK100 became a kind of mantra for us, a, a leading star for how we made decisions in years to come. SK100 was a Scandinavian Airlines flight to Bangkok. So we made an, uh, a, a kind of eclipse like that, and that was the countries in which we were at the, mo at the time. We had roughly 12 million customers when we made this one for the first time. Then we said 100 million subscribers. We said 100 billion in revenues. And we said 100 in stock price. Doesn't seem very impressive when you see where we are today. But at that point in time, we didn't speak loudly about this. Because many of you, we in a way judge that as being pretty foolish. What do they think they are? Um, and it was a very hairy target. Uh, and the SK100 uh, strategy plan, as we called it, at that point in time, uh, became the platform on how we moved step by step, uh, also into new markets, uh, and uh, building it stone by stone, so to speak. But again, at the bottom of that was the mobile phone is for everyone. And when you took a look on the countries and the number of people available there, 100 million was not uh, impossible. Along with that, we also uh, added uh, an aspect of control and exit. It's better to be in control of everything which is going on uh, than to share in a partnership of owners that uh, will gradually, potentially, also uh, split in, uh, in alignment of a strategy. Uh, and we worked through the decentralized model. The driving force was the country CEO, and the support functions was where the group could add scale effects to the advantage of every um, operation as such. Well, it became a success. We grew rapidly. And it really started to grow in 2005 and 2006 when the handset price fall down on below $30 a piece. That was at the high days of Nokia, when Nokia really took a global position on mobile handsets. Um, the third building block to really develop the Telenor was to go into the cultural aspects. How do we build a business culture that can sustain those critical moments where we really have to pull strings together in order to survive competition-wise uh, or from other aspects. So step by step, we started to build the talent away. Here we really started to address business culture elements. It's a kind of compass on how we operate in the Telenor group, how you should recognize us or in a sort of top-down um, look-in when you take um, a view on Telenor. And in where we are today, the technology elements of mobile is available for everyone. It's no longer so that we have a unique technology element that basically outcompete the other players in this world. Technology is basically available 
and it develops fast for everyone. Finance is also available to everyone, at least these days. Not necessarily in the full period here, but uh, these days finance is plentiful. So what is then the sustainable advantage? Yes, it boils down to the people. How can the people and the energy of the organizations step forward, understand the uh, opportunities in the local market, and move on it, execute upon it, and take positions? Um, and in this setup, the two most important elements are probably those of exploration and empowerment. To explore and find the opportunities and to uh, empower and execute. To get hold of the resources that is needed to carry through a good idea. That's empowerment in practice. And Myanmar is our very best example on how this business culture exposes itself illustrated by this, build, uh, this picture here. Uh, the learning curve here is that if you allow responsibility to people locally, they will take that responsibility and they will execute. Um, when we did Myanmar, we were in a, in a mature situation when we started one year ago. One year ago, we had nothing. Today, we have an organization of 650 people. We have uh, close to 2,000 uh, base stations. We cover 50% of the country. We have 12 million customers in one year. That's not bad. Uh, we got 514,000 customers the very first day in, uh, in uh, Yangon. Anyone copying that? No. Uh, so think about it. 541,000 is almost double the uh, number of people in Bergen. Line them up, ask them to go twice through a, a shop and sign up for a mobile um, phone, uh, buy a phone uh, or buy a car and, and sign it out and go out using it. We had, of course, a, a failure rate of 65 uh, on call completion that, uh, that weekend, so it was, uh, it was a struggle to, to, uh, to get, it, get it to, ha to happen, but we did it. Another example was uh, the Bangladeshi incident on child labor in 2008. That was a very formative uh, moment for Telenor. Because it showed to us that as a global player, it was expected that we don't only took responsibility for our own way of execute our own things, but we had to go into the supply chain as well and make sure that production of those uh, local elements that we needed to develop the uh, industry was also done properly. So it took, it took us into a complete new way of thinking um, uh, in health, security, and safety. And it brought the whole system up several notches from that um, uh, instant. It was a very tough time from a pressure point of view on us as management, but we turned this around and made it our tools in order to get the understanding in the organization to say, look here, we need to take responsibility of the supply chain in countries which uh, do not think in those terms uh, as strong as we do. So now we have deep relationship with most uh, companies and suppliers to us, uh, with the ambition of controlling that this is done uh, fairly well on, uh, on also unannounced audits, uh, etc. Et so Telenor Way is now a platform. It's become uh, a platform for how all our 33,000 um, employees works, up against 1.5 million points of sales in our 11 countries. It's become the base for hiring people, and it was definitely the base for how, uh, when we did our rebranding to this uh, blue kind of uh, thing that we did in 2006. Uh, so uh, the Telenor way is the third element that, in a way, can explain uh, our uh, development in, um, uh, in uh, uh, this space for so many years. And it's not frozen. It needs to be revised, repositioned, 
uh, and find the, uh, the relevant elements in order to keep it alive. Um, digital service providers is something new. In this hall now, you are not so concerned about whether you are using Netcom or, Tele or Telenor. Or okay, thank you. Um, but you're very much concerned that your applications are playing with you. You want to use your stuff. You want to, um, you want to uh, really be able to access whatever there is that you're interested in. And funny enough, I haven't seen too many of you dipping your head into your mobile phone as of yet. That's good for me, uh, uh, at least from uh, speaking up here. But we, all, we, we do this on, on every corner. And that's part of uh, the mantra here. When we opened here in Myanmar, this is um, a technical engineer, May. She is the first one taking a video call locally in Myanmar to the telecom minister. And as part of the Telenor way of, of thinking, we activate local employees into what we're doing. It could have been me doing that first, first uh, conversation, of course, but in, in, uh, in the way of becoming local, we use local forces. Uh, but lo uh, service provisioning becomes the new thing. In the digital service space, when penetration of numbers of, of users is coming to the top of the S-curve. Then where is the future value creation opportunities when everything goes digital? That's on the service side. Um, and the big players, they are uh, positioned from the United States, most of them. Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, uh, you know the names. Apple, not to mention. Um, these Global services are pushed into our hands from one global server, literally. They are not local to the same extent as we are as uh, net uh, network operators. But for you and all other users to, uh, users to thrive on this, you need good quality networks, good handsets, and attractive services. That's an ecosystem with clear interdependencies when, uh, when they grow. But it's a difficult thing for operators which are locally embedded to meet the challenges of Google's and, uh, and Facebook's of the world. And as an example, Google um, built Norwegian addresses for 1.9 billion Norwegian kroner last year, 2014, and paid 1.7 million in, uh, in tax. And that's a tax rate that uh, uh, not even uh, present governments accepts uh, versus uh, the incorporated life. So uh, the rebalancing here of same service, same rules, is a big challenge between the global digital service providers and us as local taxable and heavy regulated players. But both are needed in order to see the digital world moving, uh, moving forward. This, uh, all this um, happening uh, gives us strong forces of change into our societies. And listen to this. We're all becoming publishers. If you really have something interesting to, pu to publish, you can get it into the hands of billions of people. You can reach the planet in one go. Um, a good idea locally can go global. Think about it, that's a dream, huh? Um, and very small resources can actually realize it. And you can have global impact from a corner of the world, so to speak. Uh, one example is Line, which you might not have heard about, but it's Asia's most um, progressing uh, messaging platform. It was made in Japan, by four uh, people in th three to four weeks after the Tohoku earthquake in um, 2011 as a communication platform 
to enable people to, uh, to, to follow things more uh, closely. Today, it reaches out to 700 million persons in Japan, primarily, and Thailand. And this company is um, uh, noted to go public this year with the value of 30 to 35 billion US dollars. That's more than the value of Telenor. This is kind of the dimensions which are uh, at stake here, if you can get this business model uh, to go. So um, that means all of us have to rethink our relevance to our customers. Because we were a messaging platform as, as, uh, as, uh, in our industry. But this messaging platform was not renewed with new aspects in the way Line managed to do it. And Line brought something which hit customers, and Line took over the messaging more or less as we had had it as an SMS platform. And the same is in this hall as well. When you send SMSs today, you probably not necessarily uh, use uh, Telenor platform only. You mix it between um, uh, the other um, uh, messaging platform available, either it's Apple or if it's Google or others. Um, so what do we do? What, have, what do we have to do going forward here? Yes, we have to participate in uh, the digital service development. We need to go into financial services. We need to go into Internet of Things. And we need to go into other electronic um, uh, services, like e-commerce. That's why, where we uh, combined our activities with Shipstead and made a complete new global uh, development with, with them. They were good at what they do. We had local presence to go um, with us. We are empowering societies. The UN Millennium Goals uh, are bound to be uh, sorted out, and there are new sustainability development goals to be uh, accepted by UN uh, in two to three days. Digital will be, and telecommunication will be, very, very important means in order to get these development uh, goals to move forward. And we intend to uh, participate in these 17 goals, uh, on both health as aspects, education, financial uh, services, and education in general. Connectivity is the enab enabler. Now, I mentioned Myanmar. Um, Bill Clinton once said, phones means freedom. Jeffrey Sachs said, the most informative, uh, transformative technology invented. I don't think we can feel it, but it's an evolution. Um, lately, Facebook uh, bragged about having one billion users in one day. That seems like an impressive figure. But we probably uh, engage four billion people daily with mobile communication services. So we're in the game together on realizing this. I'm more or less a uh, digital immigrant. I have um, lived with it as it has uh, developed, but I'm not probably the toughest users of this. The toughest users are probably the younger part of uh, this uh, hall uh, here today. In the 70s, we wrote letters back home. Uh, I happen to have a family member in the room here uh, today, and uh, his, um, his student life is available on Facebook. Uh, probably better described than what I described in my letters in the 70s, anyway. Um, but students today, you are digital natives. You are the future users on, uh, on how these things will de de develop. But you're also in the global talent competition. There are so many talent development in countries out there that the global competition for talent is on. So my advice to you, number one, go abroad, see what's happening out there, and don't seek shelter in the Norwegian model for too long. Go out, learn new things. I went to Japan in 1982 for the Norske Veritas, and it was so rewarding for me uh, later. Uh, to understand Japan was probably impossible, and it so happens that I'm going back to Japan on Friday 
for one week's holiday uh, in order to see how things have developed there. So I'm looking forward to that. My next advice to you, don't take shortcuts. Be true to yourself and your values. Go out there, deliver your best, and you will be noted. Um, I have got a kind of a figure here now, so uh, five minutes, was that what you said? So now I need to uh, sharpen myself here. Um, the um, digitalization of society is moving fast. Anyone recognizing this? This is Per Gynt at Gorovad uh, this autumn. And it's a selfie where they really put, uh, after some time, uh, this is taken with a mobile phone, by the way. Pretty good quality. Uh, but they put uh, Per Gynt uh, in the middle of everything and took a selfie pictures with all the, uh, uh, the, the trolls next to him. And it was a perfect description on how uh, this personality was sort of built into new technology elements. Uh, fascinating to see and had, uh, had great um, effect on the people uh, knowing the, the picture that was um, taken. Um, this is Myanmar. Uh, I've been lucky and privileged. You are privileged. We are privileged in our, in our nation. As a nation, we have probably uh, taken the biggest, biggest um, uh, prize in any kind of competition by just being born in this country. This country has been locked away from the opportunities that comes with um, modern life. But now they escalate into a mature business model, and we, among others, facilitate this happening. Also for this country, there are phenomenal opportunities. This pop the pop population of this country is fairly well uh, in knowledge of modern life, but have been prevented from taking part in modern life. I said 12 million customers already, that's roughly 40% of the market, 35, 40. Uh, so uh, this is happening. And this little chap, he is part of the education uh, program that we launched uh, last year on uh, st to streets kids. So he's been picked up, given the opportunity. And with the right things of, um, of elements that might happen to this little chap uh, in the years to come, uh, he might participate in the world's active life like this 10 years from now. This is empowerment in practice. This is um, how to contribute to societal development. And by connecting everyone, everywhere, we deliver opportunities for people to take part in a better life in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for one or two questions. There are microphones for anyone? Yeah. We always had questions when we were students here. <laughs> <laughs> but that was because the presentation wasn't that clear all the time. Oh. <laughs> OK. Yes. There is a microphone uh, coming. <laughs> My name is Knut Leroy. Uh, since you know I retired, it's a simple question. Can you think about something you would have done different looking back? Yeah, I, uh, I got that question by a journalist earlier today. And when I 
we, if I go down that road, uh, then a, a journalist will normally put that up as a headline. <laughs> so yes, there are things we should have done otherwise uh, and differently. However, to point out one of them uh, is no point to me. And I, my argument for that is that in such a big system, in such a strong development, there will be elements that uh, will turn out negative. Uh, and these elements, uh, we should gladly have been them without if we had full decision power over it. Uh, however, I, uh, I, there, there also needs, unfortunately, to be uh, some failures associated with the pluses. And with us over this period, the pluses outnumber the minuses. Ingo? Yeah. Not on? Yes. Nope. Okay. Uh, my name is Inger Stansucker. I work here and I've had the opportunity to do research on Telenor along with many colleagues for the last few years. So in your presentation, you emphasize the local, the local and how local you are in some of the Asian countries. And what we've been looking at is your attempts to globally integrate and industrialize Telenor. Can yep. you comment on that? Yeah. Um I would say um, after the financial crisis in 2008, we probably scaled up the search for uh, positive scale effects. What does it mean that Telenor as a group is a good owner of a local activity? And what does uh, the group feed as strength to a local operation? So we are more centralized in 2015 than what we were in, uh, for example, 2010. Uh, but we have not taken away uh, the local uh, responsibility for everything that has to do with market understanding and um, uh, go-to-market issues, because that's always a, a local element, and it depends on the market structure in general, uh, what kind of means that you would use. Uh, but in purchasing for equipment and in business culture, uh, in the Telenor way of working, it's all Telenor and it's one recipe. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they uh, have the same means all, uh, in all our countries. There's uh, one back there. One final question at the back. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually from Bangladesh, but living in Bergen. So nice to hear my country story. Uh, one more addition from insider, as an insider. Uh, also, mobile companies, I mean, in my early age, I saw that there is a problem of bribes. You have to pay bribes for getting fixed phones. So mobile phones actually break this uh, bribe cycle. So that's a great success. So that's one addition. And uh, one question is, what is the main factor, uh, the, I mean, to become successful in the Bangladesh market? I mean, in especially the fiber optical cables monopoly by Telenor. Thank you. Uh, a little bit uh, challenging to get uh, to the core of your question, uh, but I, I believe uh, you point to uh, um, the, the different technologies that come with fiber versus uh, mobility. And if that was the question, uh, then uh, fiber becomes a more and more important element uh, in order to add capacities to the uh, base stations in the particular the, uh, in the transition bef between 3G to 4G. Because the base stations with 4G, without the fiber connectivity, doesn't deliver that much more capacity uh, than uh, what the backhaul uh, connectivity does. So there, th th this is an investment cycle that comes uh, in out stronger when a market takes the step from 3G to 4G than from 2G to 3G. I don't know if that picked your question, but uh, that was how I understood it. OK? OK, I think we have to close the classes are waiting. And uh, 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 thank you again, Jon Fredrik Boxers, Flowers. Thank you. And, uh,
two interesting uh, books, one about Stato Lemkul and one of the pre previous lectures. So Thank you very today. much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.